A reading from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I have chosen my king from among his sons. As Jesse and his sons came to the sacrifice, Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not judge from his appearance or from his lofty stature, because I have rejected him. Not as man sees does God see, because man sees the appearance, but the Lord looks into the heart. In the same way, Jesse presented seven sons before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any one of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? And Jesse replied, there is still the youngest who is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send for him. We will not begin the sacrificial banquet until he arrives here. Jesse sent and had the young man brought to them. He was a ruddy, he was ruddy, a young handsome to to behold and making a splendid appearance. The Lord said, there, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel, with the horn of oil in his hand, anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. The Word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruitless works of darkness. Rather, expose them for it is shameful even to mention the things done by them in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. He sat on the ground, spat on the ground, and made clay with the saliva, and smeared the clay on his eyes, and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is. But others said, No, he just looks like him. He said, I am. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So then the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes and I washed, and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you have to say about him? 
since he opened your eyes. He said, He is a prophet. They answered and said to him, You were born totally in sin, and you are trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. When Jesus heard they had thrown him out, he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshipped him. The Gospel of the Lord. These days, most of us know about free range on menus, but 10 or 12 or however many years ago it was, it was a little bit of a surprise. At a restaurant somewhere down in Delaware, which I suppose is the capital of free range chickens. Actually, no, it's just the opposite. Delaware is probably the capital of cooped up chickens. But was at a restaurant there with some friends from the area and there was on the menu the possibility of free-range chicken. And of course, it had to be explained what was a free-range chicken and how it had the advantages of being able to run around and think big thoughts and not be cooped up and get plenty of exercise. And you paid $6 more for the free-range chicken than you would for the common hen from the house. So of course, when I got home, this was a point of great hilarity. I had to call my brother Peter and explain to him this new concept of free-range. And that caused a lot of conversation about different kinds of animals and which ones would be good as free range and which ones wouldn't. Free range chicken sounded like worth paying more for, but a free range oyster or a free range clam, I mean, really, what's the difference? That conversation about free range animals led to conversation about free range people and then, of course, to free range children. Years later, after this conversation, we had to include in Peter's obituary the fact that he was one of the original free-range children. His idea of rules and norms and conventions was a little bit like, unlike, I should say, unlike other people's. And so he thought different ways and had different concepts, and he was sort of a free-range child, not so much cooped up by the conventions and the influence of a lot of other people was able to recall at that first time that I knew that Peter was a little bit different, a free-range kid. He was probably nine, which means I was maybe six or seven. And we had a big old radio with tubes in it, in the living room stereo, in the wall. And Peter took it upon himself. He had to figure out how this thing worked. And so he dismantled this thing completely when nobody else was home. I was the only one there to watch him. And he had all these tubes and dials and bands out stretched out on the dining room table and I thought oh no this isn't going to go well when the other people come back how's granny going to listen to Lawrence Welk or whatever else was going on but he got it all back together and it worked just fine it didn't go so well when he got inquisitive about my father's espresso maker which was a story in and of itself he dismantled the whole thing figured out how it worked put it back together unfortunately when he put it back together the place where the steam comes out instead of coming out in sort of an energetic cloud of just sort of dissipated, it came out more like a power washer and it, it was this jet of steam and so dad went in, turned on the espresso maker, went out to do whatever he was doing, came back in and all the wallpapers hanging off the kitchen ceiling. He figured out pretty quickly that Peter had something to do with the espresso maker. So there is a free range kid and sometimes things go well. Sometimes the radio gets put back together and everybody's happier because of it. And sometimes things don't go well. And there's no right answer one way or the other. Are we always supposed to allow people to be free range? That is, operate without so much emphasis on the rules and the regulations and the norms and the conventions? Or is it better to let them be a little bit more managed? It's not as if one thing is always right and one thing is always wrong. It's situational. And today's readings give us Jesus showing that question is an important one. Because Jesus in today's gospel 
in the story of the man born blind, treats the man born blind as a free-range disciple. And that becomes apparent in three things that Jesus did not do in his encounter with the man born blind. First off, when Jesus spat on the ground and made clay and put the saliva and the mud and the clay and all the goop on the guy's, on the fellow's eye, what did he tell him to do? He told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, right. Did Jesus take him by the hand and lead him to the pool of Siloam? No. He said to the blind man, be on your way. You can find your way. Remember, he was still blind at that point. Jesus didn't have a whole lot to do with managing this guy's trip from where he was to the pool of Siloam. Let him go on his own way. He'll figure it out, you know, and if he gets lost, somebody will help him. First thing, getting to the pool. The second thing, when the man encountered the Pharisee's anger, did Jesus intervene? When the Pharisee started to ask the guy and accuse him and belittle Jesus, did Jesus show up and start to give all the tough answers? No, he didn't. He let that man fend for himself. He let him act as a free-range disciple. And in the very beginning of the story, we notice the free-range influence. Jesus didn't meet this man because someone had arranged an appointment. This is not like the story of when the fellows came and lowered their friend through the roof after they moved the tiles. No, this is Jesus walking by, noticing the man, and starting this conversation. There was nothing premeditated or organized about it. From start to finish, this is a free-range encounter. But let's not assume that Jesus always preferred free-range. There are those moments when Jesus energetically inserted himself in the situation. In the case of the woman caught in adultery, remember, Jesus jumped into the middle of that circle. He stood up on her behalf. He started asking the tough questions. He diffused the situation. He didn't leave her to fend for herself. And so it was with the story of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus didn't just let the disciples figure it out and maybe get thrown overboard or maybe figure out how to reef their mainsail so they could sail in a storm. No, he came and he calmed the storm. There are so many instances when Jesus intervenes in the situation, when he doesn't just let the people figure it out for themselves, but there are those moments when Jesus encourages the free-range approach, when he lets people make their own mistakes, give them lots of room to make great big mistakes, gives them lots of discretion, self-determination, and sometimes he doesn't. It's not as if one answer always fits. In the first reading today, with the story of King David and how Samuel came and chose David from among Jesse's children, Remember, where was David when the story started? He was not in Bethlehem with the other brothers, with other Jesse's other sons. And there are all sorts of reasons out there about why it is maybe that David was apart from the others. But whatever the reason, we know that he was apart from the others. When Samuel came to anoint the new would-be king, David was out tending the sheep. As we put the pieces together, we can see that David was probably about 12 years old when this was going on. And the place where he tended the sheep was not in the backyard of his father's house. It wasn't as if they could lean out the window and say, David, come home, we have visitors. No. David was at a significant distance. He could easily have been the distance, say, from here to Rocky Hill or from here to Nishanik in the other direction. So it was a little bit of a trip. They had to send someone to get David. Now, all that adds up to the fact that David was a free-range kid. David was out there by himself at age 12 in the wilderness, tending his father's sheep. That's a pretty dangerous situation. All sorts of wild animals, and Lord only knows who's going to come along. And we know that David learned great things out there for starters, Think of it, David learned how to play the harp while he was out there on the range. Probably wasn't one of those great big sort of philharmonic harps he'd have, you know, have to get a moving van to move it around. No, he probably started off with a little bit of a Jew's harp and then a bigger harp. But remember, that harp is the thing that won King Saul's favor. 
When David played the harp, the demons left King Saul. David's time out there alone produced great results. In another way, David's time out on the range produced great results because that's where he learned how to use a slingshot. There was, where the, there was where he learned that this is the way you wind the thing up and this is how you let it go. And he later bragged that he took out all sorts of wild animals, including a giant bear. And learning how to use the slingshot, he was then able to go do business with Goliath. David learned some very valuable lessons when he was out there as a free-range youth. And finally, David learned self-reliance. He learned lessons out there by himself that would serve him well and enable him to trust his own judgment. The free-range experience was very beneficial for David and for the children of Israel. But it wasn't an unmixed blessing. There was a downside to it. One could assume that David's children, especially Absalom, sort of inherited that free-range gene, and it didn't go well. We also know that maybe some of David's free-range choices, like with the wife of Uriah the Hittite, maybe that was born of his sense of open space and self-determination. It's not as if the free-range is always the answer. It's not as if the free-range is always a complete blessing. No, sometimes it's not the answer. And sometimes it produces very mixed results. Sometimes the radio gets put back together. Sometimes the espresso maker takes all the wallpaper off the kitchen ceiling. It's not as if one size fits all, as if Jesus is always saying to us, give the other lots of space or manage that other one's existence as much as you can. Nope. But we know from David and we especially know from Jesus that the question is worth asking. In terms of kindness, What's the kindest thing I can do for this other person in terms of giving them the space that they want or giving them the space they don't want? Clearly, the question arises in the way parents raise their children, and I'd like to be very clear here, I am not offering advice to people about how to raise your children. The people of Hillsborough are doing a fine job. There's more terrific kids per square yard here than there are even, I think, in Lake Wobegon. You're doing an excellent job in so many ways of raising your kids. They work hard. They pray hard. They're good athletes. They're good students. They're nice kids. That's not the point. The point is just to raise the question and say, okay, maybe the Lord is asking me to give this one less space or more space, whether or not the student wants less or more space. Is it time to let this kid be a little bit more free range? Maybe the question is, should this child be allowed to go to college away from home? Should they be allowed to go on some school trip? Should they be allowed to go on Catholic hard work camp? Should they be allowed to do any number of things where they're going to be off on their own, fending for themselves with supervision, but having to figure it out a little bit more? Or maybe the child has too much freedom right now and needs to be reined in just a little bit. It's not as if there's one right answer all the time. The question is, what do you think God is asking you to do as a parent for your child? Students, the question falls on you as well. Maybe you're expecting a little bit too much of the free-range experience, and you're not being realistic. Or maybe you're clinging too close to home, and you need to have more free-range experience. Again, there's not one off-the-shelf answer that fits everybody. Students, I would just ask you to think, what's the kindest thing that you can do for your loved ones? Lean back a little bit, dial it down in terms of, I need more space, I need more self-determination, or maybe try to get a little bit more. And it's not just with children. It's the whole new concept of free-range geriatrics. There are many people of a certain age who are helping to take care of their families, their elder loved ones. And we know that in so many circumstances, those people want to maintain their freedom. They want their driver's license. They want to continue to live in the big house. They want to be able to do things on their own. Okay. They want to be a free-range granny or a free-range grandpa. And maybe that's a great idea, or maybe it needs to be revisited. It's the same thing at work. Do you let your employees be free-range types more or less? It's in the neighborhood. Do you just let things happen? It's with the social clubs and the athletic organizations. 
There are so many places where we can ask that question. In terms of the free range thing, is the Lord asking me to give the other more space? Or should I insert myself more? Once again, there's not one answer that's right all the time. The only thing that's right all the time is the question, what's God hoping for here? And let us try to think of those situations in terms of the free range factor. Lord, help me to know what you want and want what you want and do what you want as I live out my relationship with these very precious others. And yes, sometimes the radio will get put back together and sometimes the wallpaper will fall off the ceiling. All we can hope for is to line up with God's hopes. Maybe, just maybe, where should you be asking the free-range question and wondering about Jesus' desire for you and your loved ones?